it goes without saying that photography is art. You see it in museums and galleries, you study it in school as a discipline of fine arts, and you know of famous photographer artists who've made names for themselves both within and outside the art world. However, this hasn't always been the case. Believe it or not, photography struggled to gain legitimacy as a form of fine art until the late 1960s. The question, is photography art, haunted the medium from its beginnings in the 1800s when it was largely considered a scientific offshoot of optics throughout the modernist era until the arrival of conceptual art in the 1960s, and more on that in just a minute. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the majority of artists, writers, and critics considered photography to be, in the words of French poet critic Charles Baudelaire, nothing more than a mechanical intrusion into fine art. These critics saw photography as a low form of visual expression, not a legitimate form of high art, because it was prolific, by the beginning of the 20th century the camera had become accessible to a large number of people, it was reproducible, it was commercial, and it was vulgar. It was also based in science, not classical philosophy or aesthetics, which is the philosophy of beauty, as were the other traditional fine art disciplines, painting, drawing, and sculpture. But fortunately for us now, there was a vocal minority of artist photographers who believed that both the camera and photography itself were tools of artistic expression in the same way that paint, canvas, and stone were, and they made it their life's work to make photography's case as real art. In this lecture series, I'm going to look at photography as big A art. We've looked extensively at how important photography is and has been for documentary practice, but now we're going to look at how it's evolved as a creative practice and become a bona fide tool of artistic expression. To do so, as I've done with most everything else, I'm going to take a small and short step back in time and talk about how art photography coexisted with documentary photography and evolved throughout the modernist era, which is generally considered to be about 1900 to about 1945, but in our case we're going to say 1900 to 1965. And then we're going to spend a lot of time looking at how contemporary artist photographers use the camera and photography as tools to examine creative and visual expression, specifically their uses of symbolism, metaphor, fiction and narrative, and how the idea of what photography is today and has become is extremely broad and interdisciplinary. In order to look at how art photography evolved in the first half of the 20th century, and by art photography I mean any kind of photography that's not straight documentary, I think it's important to define modernism. Modernism is a word I've thrown around a lot during this course, but I haven't really defined thoroughly. It's confusing because it's a term that refers both to a span of time, from about 1900 to about 1950, and also a philosophy of art. Modernist philosophy held that each art medium had unique, independent qualities, and the exploitation of those was each medium's aesthetic hallmark. In other words, there were rigid boundaries separating each artistic discipline. This idea of strict boundaries complicated things for photographers who argued that photography should be taken seriously as fine art. In the early 1900s, in efforts to be taken seriously as a form of art, photography adopted many of the conventions of painting, and as styles of painting changed, from Impressionism to Cubism to Abstract Expressionism, styles of art photography changed too. And you can see this in much of the work of the pictorialists. But there was an inherent conflict in this practice. According to modernist thinking, painting and photography were two different things and should be treated accordingly. Each medium was supposed to follow its own inherent qualities and capabilities without external reference, either to other art forms or to the world itself. In other words, painting should be painting for painting's sake, and photography should be photography for photography's sake. The two shouldn't mix. Modernist thinking is why documentary photography developed into such a dominant and dynamic force in the first half of the 20th century. The camera was a tool that recorded objective fact, and a photograph was a visual record capturing the realism of life, a particular time, event, etc. Documentary photography didn't try to be painting, and it didn't try to take anything from painting. It was its own practice with its own significance. So modernist thinking really elevated documentary photography, Photo photojournalists were a type of celebrity on their own, but it repressed more creative photography and stifled the artistic voice of the photographer. Two key figures responsible for breaking away from the documentary mode and advocating for photographs to be expressions of the photographer artist's personal vision instead of merely objective representation were Alfred Stieglitz in the United States and Laszlo Moholy-Nagy in Europe. We've met Stieglitz before, 
In the 1890s, he managed the Camera Club of New York and published the journal Camera Notes and used it to champion his belief in photography as a legitimate art form, including in it articles on art and aesthetics and prints by leading American and European photographers. In 1902, he held the tremendously important Photo Secession Show in New York, with which he meant to declare a secession from the artistic restrictions of the era and pictorialism, and he started a new journal, Camera Work. During this time period, Stieglitz set the tone and style of modern artistic photography, but it still tended to follow painting. By 1917, as he was trying to reconcile artistic photography with modernist thinking and philosophy, he advocated for purism, which called for sharp focus and unvarnished style, a way of taking pictures that was true to the qualities inherent in the medium itself without a need for artistic enhancement with tone and focus that we saw with pictorialism. The result was photography as a new and independent medium with its own unique personalities and limitations, and we can see this shift in the works of Edward Weston and Paul Strand, both of whose works Stieglitz showcased in his galleries. Stieglitz's advocacy of purism and his emphasis that the intrinsic qualities of photography allowed for the possibility of artistic self-expression became the foundation for many styles of photography at mid-century, from Henri Cartier-Bresson to Walker Evans. He also opened the door for artist photographers like Minor White, Wynne Bullock, Paul Caponegro, and Frederick Summer to abandon documentary practice and explore spirituality, mystical thought, and the psychology of perception in their work during the 1940s and 50s. Laszlo Moholy Nagy was a student of the famous Bauhaus in Germany from 1923 to 1928, and he imported a lot of the Bauhaus philosophy into photography in Europe, and then ultimately into the United States in the first half of the 20th century. He argued that any artist needs an objective vision before arriving at a subjective work, and that photography helps achieve that objective vision. In his work, he explored the idea that the marriage of art and technology, technology being the mechanical processes of photography, could produce an aesthetic experience as opposed to a mere art object. And we see that in his photograms, photo montages, negative prints, and bird's eye views. His exploration gave rise to a number of noted abstractionist and abstract expressionist photographers of the 1940s. Georgie Kepis, Arthur Siegel, Henry Holmes Smith, Henry Callahan, and Aaron Siskind. By the 1940s, owing to the forward thinking of Stieglitz and Moholy Nagy, we began to see not just a break from, but also a repudiation of the documentary style. Artist photographers began openly questioning the objectivity of the photograph, which was a kind of an assault on what was then considered to be the essence of photography, its credibility as a simulacrum or a bona fide representation of the truth. This questioning of convention, combined with the influence of the surrealist movement of the 1930s, led to the de development of a new visual language for photography, based in emotion and psychology, myth and fantasy, and abstraction and a departure from the rationalism and the realism that had previously dominated photography. Rather than merely trying to capture a specific moment, these artist photographers explored their interest in emotional and implicit meanings and instead tried to capture allegorical, spiritual, and psychological situations or experiences. The surrealist movement of painting was rather short-lived in the arc of painting's history, but in photography it lingered well into the 1960s. This is because it was conducive to such a rebellion against the standard documentary practice that had defined mid-century photography. Surrealism is defined by the pursuit of symbolic or interpretive imagery, as opposed to straight-up objective realist images. Surrealism in photography differed from the language of documentary photography by commingling or putting together oppositional forces like life-death, real-unreal, past-future, and communicable-incommunicable in order to explore situations beyond reality and by producing images that were not necessarily meant to be mass reproduced, say in news or fashion magazines, and images that were the product of the personal, esoteric, and sometimes eccentric vision of the artist. Most importantly, the definition of truth changed for these photographers. The search for truth within the artists themselves trumped the search for truth in reality. Now, it's funny how the idea that I'm living my truth seems almost like a cliché now, but in the 1950s, that idea of any one person living and experiencing their own personal truth was radical.
Several artist photographers of the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s embodied this revolt against representation and against photography with a social purpose. Clarence John Laughlin is often referred to as the first true surrealist photographer in the United States, and he's best known for his surrealist images of the American South. His images rely on the idea of tableau, which is a group of actors or figures representing a scene from a story or history, drawn from myths of the Old South. In his images, you can see romanticism and theatricality, and he uses narrative devices like literary titles to enhance the fantastical qualities of the images themselves. His work not only reflects the influence of Eugene Atje and other early photographers who tried to capture vanishing landscapes, but also proved highly influential to generations of contemporary artist photographers. Ghosts Along the Mississippi, Lachlan's best-known book, was published in 1948. Phil Brandt was a German-born British photographer who'd done significant documentary work in the years prior to and during World War II, but largely abandoned documentary practice after the war and began a series of explorations of the female nude, transforming the body with his camera angles and framing. Frederick Sommer was an Italian-born Brazilian artist who became a U.S. citizen in the 1930s. A contemporary of Ed Weston and Ansel Adams, Sommer is considered to be a master photographer. In the late 1930s and 40s, he seriously explored the artistic possibilities of photography, encompassing the genres of still life, landscapes, jarred subjects, cut paper, cliché ver negatives, and nudes into his work. With these abstract works, he investigated a kind of hyper-reality with spiritual, personal, and symbolic themes. Val Telberg was a Russian-born artist who first began his career in painting, but then explored surrealist photography in the mid-1940s. He experimented with the photographic process itself, using double exposures and bleached or burned negatives, and he later worked with large-scale, scroll-like multiple images. Perhaps the American photographer most responsible for opening up photography's evocative and metaphorical possibilities after the 1940s was Minder White, whose work he read way back in the first module. White attended the University of Minnesota in the 1930s, but he didn't complete his degree and instead moved to Portland, Oregon and took pictures for the Oregon Art Project, which was a WPA art program, and he also taught photography. After World War II, he moved to New York and enrolled at Columbia. While in New York, White met and knew many of the modernist and pictorialist photographers that we've seen before, Alfred Stieglitz, Edward Steichen, Paul Strand, and Berenice Abbott. He moved to San Francisco in 1946 to take a teaching job at the California Institute of Fine Arts, and there he became close friends with Ed Weston and developed a teaching curriculum that emphasized creative photography. White advocated visionary meditative imagery, in which he saw metaphor as a means of moving beyond immediate reality to the unconscious, and you can see this in his series The Sound of One Hand Clapping, taken between 1957 and 1962. For White, the camera images held transcendent meaning and expression. His work, teaching, and critical writing were on the pulse of a great change in American art and were hugely influential for generations of photographers who benefited from them. Because of the foundations laid by photographers like Minor White, by the 1960s, artist photographers had moved from strictly being observers to being editors and authors of their images. The field for creative expression in photography was wide open, and photographers began to explore illusions of reality instead of reality itself, and to use fable, allegory, and visual parable to tell their visual stories.